Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 2. V21, Chapter 249. Written by P.W.O. Falcon. Alnus Command, Fort Alnus. Date, August 24, 2026. In the war room General Charles Stanford stood at the head of the table. Within him are Colonel John Young, General Chrysist, and Brigadier General Smith of the 82nd Airborne, and Empress Pina. For the better part of a week, they have been analyzing and preparing to strike Dalco and what resources they will need. It is a bold plan, Stanford said. My main concern is a repeat of what happened at Sadira. The first boots on the ground will be cut off without our usual support assist. Nothing risked, nothing gained, General, Chrysis said. Boldness is key for victory. Unnecessary risk only leads to destruction, Smith responded. That is how this war started. Calm down everyone, Pina said. We agreed to go on the offensive if Lieutenant Colonel Sharp found the weapon, which he did. If we wait, then what happened in Sadira and Rondel will happen again on our land. No one disagrees, Empress, Smith said. This city has surprised us twice now and I don't want that to happen to my men. I just don't like being forced into a box. If we start now with this timetable, at most we could deploy a brigade. That assumes the enemy waits that long to open their gate, Chrysist added. The moment we put warriors on the ground it will accelerate their timetable. Everyone understands the danger, Yang said. The truth is that we don't have many options. Either we go or we sit here and dig in. I would like you to go through the plan again, Stanford said. I want everyone to understand everything before we depart. Smith pointed to the map where Dalco was located. To avoid unnecessary danger, we will conduct a combat drop 20 kilometers from the city in this valley here. Infantry, rangers, and engineers will drop and establish a beachhead. From there, the engineers will quickly construct a makeshift airfield for our three cargo planes to land and take off. Reinforcements will then be ferried to this FOB so we can strike the city in force. Hopefully we can deploy enough force before the enemy acts. Because how close we are to the city we are worried from a counterattack, Young added. The paratroopers and rangers will be stuck in a fixed position with no way to retreat if overwhelmed. I was wondering, why not build the airfield further away? Pina asked. I know you have superior transportation technology. I rode in them on missions with Vanguard, 7. This wouldn't be a problem if we were on Earth, but we are not, Young said. So far in the war we never needed more long-range airlift until now. The problem is, we need to prioritize what we deploy. We could deploy more transport for our infantry and be further away, Smith said. However, we wouldn't have room or time to deploy a platoon of Griffin the second MPF or additional airborne assets. Or if we try to do both then we reduce the amount of infantry. You fight with what you have, Empress, Chrysist said. Not with what you want. Never draw words, Stanford commented. We will have to rely on our bomber fleet to weaken and hold back the enemy. Speaking of the fleet, Smith replied. Most of our fleet will be out of range, leaving our few bombers and airlift being the only ones able to reach that far. This damn city is almost on the other side of the continent so if they have air support like what happened in Sadira, the infantry will be on their own. I might be able to get the air force to deploy additional B-1S Lancers from Earth, Stanford said. Timing will be tight though. Looking over the map, Stanford asked. A drop in normal conditions is hazardous. Couldn't we just launch an armored spearhead straight there to rendezvous with the 82nd? Now that the Empire has been defeated, couldn't they alleviate any Imperial holdouts who have yet to learn that the war is over? I already ordered Legatus Fabius Aulus and his Legion East, Pina said. He should be handling those holdouts and cities who still don't know that the war is over. I talked with Major General Morgan Howard regarding a land invasion, Smith said. It can be done, however by the time they reach us the battle would be over. Either we would have won, or they would be needed here in the defense of Alcatraz. In addition, this is unknown territory, Young added. As we already pointed out that most of these cities wouldn't know that the war is over and there has been a regime change. We don't know if cities will surrender, especially with an armor column at their doorstep. Then we will need every man and machine possible to defend this region, Chrysist pointed out. 
absolutely hating the situation and the option, Stanford analyzed the map and planned carefully. The defensive option is clearly off the table. For the first time in the war, he wondered if this was how the old imperial generals must have felt as now the roles were reversed, having to defend their territory from an outside force. While an armored spearhead force is preferable, however saw no way it could reach Dalko within the timetable they have. The timeliness of a week is something they made up based on how quickly they can mobilize a response that far. They have no idea how credible that timeliness was. It was clear that if they were going to go on the offensive then speed is the key. Dropping and deploying a small but effective force seemed to be their only option that met their goals. All right, Brigadier General Smith and General Crisis, your forces have a go ahead, Stanford said. Begin as soon as possible. Hold on, I will also be going with on the operation, Pina said, giving her brother a nasty look. I will lead the legions into this battle. I told you before Empress, no, Crisis responded shamelessly. Let me remind you again that you made me general of the army and I will act as such. The front lines are not your place. I do not care, Pina said. I am not being sidelined now after everything I have done to get here. Seeing the tension between the two, Stanford expected something like this. Crisis was a seasoned general while Pina recently took the leadership of not just the military and a nation. The general is correct, Empress. Stanford saw a shock reaction from Pina as she did not expect him to side with her brother. You are not a soldier anymore but a leader of a nation. A very fractured one at that that is only being held together by my army occupying your cities. You have competent generals, you need to utilize them. While not thrilled, Pina nodded and looked at the table. Young pointed to the road between the proposed air base and Dalco. From there. We will march against the city and take the city. Can I ask a question? Pina asked. This is an open forum, Stanford answered. Be free to speak your mind. I know how hesitant your people are in deploying WMDs but, with how dangerous Dalco has become and the threat of the demons, would nuking the city seems reasonable besides going through all this effort? By your standards, Dalco already has WMD Rondel and Sadira. What is this WMD and nuking you are speaking? Crisis asked. A bomb that can wipe out a city with a single blast, Pina answered. I saw footage of the sheer destructive power of these weapons while on Earth. You had such weapons and never deployed them. Crisis said, shocked by the news. Why is this not a first priority? Because the destruction is so massive, all the negative consequences outweigh any benefits, Yang said. They are not just another bomb. They are the bomb. If we used it against the Empire, it would only hinder our short and long term goals. Regarding Dalco, this has been discussed with the President and Joint Chiefs, Stanford said. Nuking the city is considered a last resort. If the battle is lost against Dalco or if the demon gate opened and the demons cannot be contained, I have been given authority to deploy the weapon. Why wait so long? Crisis asked. Because what if it doesn't work? Stanford said. We have no idea if a nuke can destroy a gate. Area 51 has been studying the subject since last year however they have no idea. Our current science does not understand enough on how the gate works, Stanford added. Especially now we know it has a relationship with the gods who summon them. If we drop the bomb and it does not destroy the gate, then we screwed ourselves as now we cannot deploy ground forces to contain the enemy. I see, Pina said, placing her hand on her chin to think. And I think we can assume these demons are resistant to this nuclear poison you spoke of. It is called. Radon? Radiation, Stanford corrected. Wheel, they are coming from hell so who knows, Young pointed out. The point is, we do not have the knowledge to make an informed decision, Stanford said. If our ground assault fails, whatever bomber that is still on station will drop a B-61 gravity bomb. If that is what we do, how will we evacuate everyone? Pina asked. Silence covered the room as no one wanted to address that question. Crisis was the one who answered, there isn't one Pina. It is a one-way trip. The general is correct, Stanford said. If the mission is a bust, there will not be enough time to evacuate everyone. Nor will the enemy allow it, Yang said. 
between Vorka and his demons, it would be impossible to organize a retreat. We would never get everyone out, assuming they were not overrun by a horde. Oh, I understand, Pina said with a distressed look. All right, Stanford said. I approve of the operation. Dismiss. As the officers left the room, Stanford noticed that Pina remained. Can I help you? Pina stood there, taking a frustrated and nervous breath. Almost like she was worried. Yes, Pina said. Why did you agree with my brother? Exactly what I said before, Stanford replied. But I want to be out there. I have been fighting side by side with my Rose Knights, with Vanguard 7, and with my Legionaries. I do not want to be sidelined now when the fate of the world is on the line. Then you never should have become Empress, Stanford responded. Stanford understood how the young Empress was feeling. The price of being successful and becoming a leader of a nation. He smiled, remembering when he claimed the chain of command, realizing the burden of command. The transition from being on the ground vs being at headquarters. M look, Stanford said. This is going to be a new reality for you. You are no longer a leader of a rebellion but a leader of a nation. What you want no longer matters. The only thing that matters is what is best for your country and that means not throwing yourself away on the front lines. You have generals, staff to do these tasks for you. Pina took a deep frustrated breath and grabbed the table. Is this how it is going to be going forward? Yes, it is, Stanford said, taking a drink from his coffee. We all go through it. I still remember when I was a platoon commander, going on patrols with my men in Iraq. But even then, I had to have my NCOs take the lead on my orders. We are not grunts, we have command responsibilities. Your experience with Vanguard, Seven, was more an exception than the rule. Let that rare insight gild you as Empress. You are right, Pina said. I knew that. That was why I gave my brother leadership of the army. I guess I just was not ready to accept that. Besides, I highly doubt your president would allow me to go on such a dangerous mission now that I have Sadira. I was not going to bring that up but yes, Stanford said. Too much was sacrificed to risk you dying in such an operation. Pina began to laugh. You know, I hated my father for never allowing me to go anywhere and I considered my brother, Zorzal, a coward for not fighting on the battlefield. The reason I created the Rose Order of Knights was to see the world. To be all I can be. To have a life. Now, I am starting to see what must be going through their minds. I see myself being stuck back on the throne, trapped in the same halls I desperately wanted to escape not so long ago. I am back to where I started. The seat of power is all-encompassing but also cursed. Don't sell yourself short, Stanford said. Your father was an arrogant as who blindly blushed his nation into war with another planet, with zero consideration. Your other brother was just a spoiled brat who was just protecting his inheritance. Nothing more. You are correct, Pina said. Thank you general. Life can be strange. Yes it can be, Stanford said. Anything else Empress? Not at this time general, thank you. Dalco, the Great Plains of Fulmart. Kargash Paprila and her husband Galric followed closely behind their demon god Vorka, that who's willingly possessed by the god Zufmut, passed through the wicked streets of Dalco. Crowds of mags, sages, and presents who are all loyal to their city all celebrating their master. The war has been going far better than the city leadership expected. While Hardy tried to delay her intervention became a blessing in disguise. The war proved to be an excellent distraction, allowing the two to move through the countryside with the Empire Blessing. No one could have imagined taking the demon corpses from a run labyrinth could have been this easy. Even infatuation with their Rondel rival without any suspicion was far easier than ever hoped. With Rondel being knocked out as a threat for at least a generation, probably two, that only left the Empire and NATO. As before, that goal required little effort. Playing the Empire arrogance and NATO lack of knowledge of this world against them. Allowed them to be on the verge of opening their gate. As the crowd cheer for their recent victory at Sadira. There was some damage from the sudden bombers from Alnus aircraft however damage was little, only restricted to residential areas. 
the heart of the city, which was built within a small mountain range, an ancient dwarf city reproposed and became Dalko, the city of dark magic. Heading to the stone railing, Kargash saw the ritualistic open coffee on a large wagon. With the exception of the missing head the rest of the giant body lay motionless. While most corpses would have rotted away within months the thousands of years old demon body still had all its flesh. As if it only perished yesterday. Is that the demon mommy? Fagrish asked. Yes, my baby little boy, Kargash replied. This is why we went to Rondel and why we had to come back here. Where is the demon head? Galric responded however Kargash was forced to translate for him. She could tell he desperately wanted to be a father, but the hardy curse took that away from him. This has been the dynamic of their relation for over a decade which has caused great pain and strength between them. She earns the days where she could hear his voice as he once had. Being cursed to speak a dead language for the rest of his life. All because of the goddess Hardy's traitorous deal to where he agreed to this curse and in return saved his now wife, Kargash, from her family. In return, she spent all her life learning the language. Sadly, her husband and son were never able to have a proper relationship without her as a translator. Something she hoped Zufmut would solve. She translated as her love told the story how their master now merged with the god, Zufmut, took the demon head to Sadira which summoned warriors from hell and defeated the Imperials and other worlders. With two of the most powerful cities now laid in ruin nothing will be able to stop their plans. Very cool, Fagrish said. With the rest of the body, is that how our lord will bring the rest of the demons? Yes, my son, Kargash said as she moved her hand through her son's hair. The new gods will replace the old dash dot. And will I be able to understand my father? We hope so, Kargash said. But we will finally be free to live our ways. Our time has come. You both have served me well. Hearing their lord's voice, Kargash saw Vorka march toward them. He stopped and gazed at the corpse. We can finally complete our destiny. Hearing her husband speak the dead language that he was cursed to speak forever. Before she could translate, Vorka responded. Tell your husband there is nothing to fear, Vorka said. Shocked that her master understood Galric. He never was able to before, which made her wonder if he now could thanks to the blessing of merging with Zufmut. None of us doubt you my lord, Kargash said. It is just strange that the time has come thanks to an ancient corpse. Looking back at the demon corpses, Kargash continued, I mean, even with the blood of this beast, it still required dozens of mags to summon one of their legendary beasts. Bypassing Hardy Gate and opening a second one will be challenging. For mere mortals that would be correct, Vorka said. He looked at his hands. Taking this form has allowed me to gain imaginable power. Something I once considered impossible until I learned of Vorka phasing ability. Now, I have the best of both realms. As he spoke, Kargash couldn't tell who was speaking. At different parts it seemed that both were talking. While she did not fully understand the rules the gods play by, she knew that if a god wants to interact with the mortal realm, they must possess someone. While this allowed them to engage with their followers directly it also means they lose much of their abilities. That is why mortals rarely see their gods outside their temples and rely on apostles. Somehow, either Vorka or Zufmut found a way around the rules. Vorka being a phantom has the ability to phase into a realm that most eyes cannot see. Opening the gate will not be a problem for me, Vorka said, tell the sages to make the final preparations and form additional protection around the temple. I want to open the gate as quickly as possible, and we must assume the enemy will try to strike. I do wonder my lord, will the other gods intervene? Kargash asked. Like how Emroy did. I dare them to try, Vorka said, hinting that he wanted them to. Then her husband asked a strange question regarding the other worlders. What will they do? Honey, what can they do? Kargash asked. Once the demon gate is open, all their technology is meaningless. To her annoyance, Galric persisted in the matter. Reminding her that the reason Rondel was not completely ruined was because of the other worlders. Vanguard 7 and their leader, Lieutenant Colonel Sharp, he is correct, Vorka said. We do not know what the earth gods have that could counter us. 
Last time my advance guard came to this world the warriors from earth had a weapon that killed my minions so we must assume if they come, before the gate finally opens then they have a weapon to fight us. I was hoping to level Sadira to the ground and keep any secrets the city had away from the other worlders. With Emroy intervention we must assume I failed with that objective. I believe that is impossible my lord, Kargash stated. Regardless, we will be ready. A mage in dark red robbing approached. My lord, our scouts discovered the other world us invading. They are setting up camp in the Sleedham Valley. That is too soon, even for them, Kargash said. The reports said that they fell from the sky with these balloon clothing that slowed their descent, the sage said. Daring, Vorka said, tell Mabel to prepare for war. Summon the army, protect the summoning temple. As Vorka and Galric walked away, Kargash kneeled to face her son. This is going to be a bloody battle my dear. I do not want you to be nearby. I want to watch, Fagrish said. I want to watch you two kill those other worlders and see the gate. I know my love, Kargash said, placing her hand on the boy's cheek. I want you to stay safe behind the city walls. Once we banish the other worlders away, I promise we will show you to our new gods. Okay mommy. Fort Minnick. Date, August 25, 2027. Hearing the pounding rain outside of the home, Sharp sat staring at the coffee table. On the table are three items. The top part of the holy spear that he was given from Apollo. The M1911 that was given by his dying mentor Major Harper. On the other side was a bottle of whiskey. It was late at night and almost everyone was asleep in their bedrooms or in Selena's case, sleeping on the couch next to him, resting for the big day to come. Dinner was exciting as everyone told stories of their latest adventures. I see she is tuckered out. Hearing his wife's voice, Sharp leaned back onto the couch. He saw her in a nightgown, holding the baby. Yep. She dozed off thirty minutes ago. Why don't you put her in bed? Sarah asked. Looking down at the kid, Sharp had to mentally correct himself now. When they first met, she was about twelve or the age they agreed to. Since then, she started to grow into a woman with the age fourteen coming up soon. How he wished he did more fathering in that short amount of time and hoped to do better going forward. I don't think I can pick her up as I once did, Sharp replied. Besides, I would rather not wake her up and she isn't hurting anyone. Cute, Sarah said. You should go to sleep. You should know by now I cannot before an op. I know, Sarah said. She walked over and sat beside him, setting two glasses on the coffee table and poured the whiskey into them. I still think you should. After handing a glass to her husband, she asked, what are you thinking about? How the hell am I supposed to kill a god with a broken stick with a knife on it? Hey, show some respect, Sarah said. I know you are tired, but don't start that now. Taking his wife's head, he led in and kissed her forehead. You're right. Just a lot of responsibility to think of. Didn't you talk with Rory about the gods? Sarah asked. I expect she might have a plan. Glancing toward his wife and looking back at the pistol. Yes, we had a long conversation about the earth gods and the big man. More than I could handle in one conversation. She knew about them from the very beginning. Apparently, all of this has been in motion since the gate opened. I told you she was a little devil, Sarah said. What did the brass say? I know, Sharp said. But I guess when a god tells you to keep a secret, I say that is a pretty good reason. We all have our roles and need to accept them. What about the government? They agreed that their presence will be kept as a secret for now and be dealt with after the war. Makes sense, Sarah said. One issue at a time. What about the spear? I am going to honor my agreement with Apollo, Sharp said. The brass was not happy about that, but I have the president backing me on this. A weapon that can kill a god. I can see why the brass wants to keep it. It could be very nifty. That is pretty much what they said. They want it just in case our gods want to become hostile. Rory made a strong case on returning the spear, saying it would be better to have an alliance with them besides enemies. 
the fact that they have not interacted with us for 2,000 years was a strong selling point. Noticing the pistol on the table, Sarah asked, why do you put your sidearm on the table? During my fight with Achilles, I had to use it to take him out, Sharp explained. I think that fight was more intentional than I originally thought. Rory made a convincing point that if I try stabbing Vorka with this lance, I will die before I get close. It makes sense so Lele and Arpeggio spent the last few days enchanting and modifying it to be able to fire the spear. Creative, but that means you will have one shot, Sarah pointed out. You cannot miss. I know, Sharp said. I don't even know if it will work. Achilles required shooting his heel. I have no idea if that applies to Volker and on top of that there is his phasing ability. It sounds like a lot of IFS on this op, Sarah said. Sounds like a normal day honestly but what is concerning me is that I doubt they will just let you get close enough to kill him. The thought also crossed Sharp's mind. Each time they faced Dalko they overall won. It required a last moment intervention or a last minute tactic change to survive. By this point, Volker and his agents have to know they are coming. They knew who a threat to them was. He knew something had to change. Looking at his wife and seeing a concerned look on her face. Breaking a smile sharp jokingly said, what is messed up is this is still less of a headache than the little devil. I heard that. Rory yelled. The two looked at each other and laughed.